welcome to the STOA. Uh, I'm Daljeet Peterson. Uh, I'm going to be co-piloting this uh, session of the STOA. Peter, our fearless steward, has uh, entrusted me with the controls, uh, and so I'm honored to be able to uh, share uh, this topic with you. There's a really uh, keen interest to me, uh, the subject of the media theorist Marshall McLuhan. Um, and we've got a great guest today, Mr. Mark Stallman from the Center for the Study of Digital Life, who is uh, uh, somewhat of an expert on the subject of McLuhan and his media theories. So uh, as a way of just introducing uh, the topic and um, what we're going to get into today, uh, I'm going to share my screen and share a few slides with you. Um, which you should be seeing now. So yeah, McLuhan retrieving the lost art of sense making. Um, and so really, I hope a provocative title that will be able to uh, pay off the promise of this premise, because the idea of retrieving this lost art of sense making uh, seems to be very um, pertinent for us all today. So first of all, just a little background on McLuhan for anyone who doesn't know about him. Um, he was actually a very little known uh, Canadian English professor um, who was a bit of a medieval scholar. And, and he sort of stumbled on to some very uh, interesting theories about media and how it affects uh, our society and wrote a number of books on it and became uh, somewhat of a celebrity during the 1960s um, during the, the counterculture really grappled on to him and his theories. Um, and he was sort of the media guru he was writing about television at a time when it was a very nascent technology and everyone wanted to pick his brain about what does it mean? How do we use this new medium? Everyone from, you know, Madison Avenue to the hippie counterculture. Um, but he sort of fell out of favor in the 70s. Uh, he had a famous cameo in uh, Woody Allen's Annie Hall, if anyone remembers that scene in line at the movie theater. Uh, but he sort of faded into obscurity a little bit and he passed away in 1980. And it wasn't until the 1990s when there was a bit of a McLuhan revival, of course, with the birth of the internet, the World Wide Web, and the guy who coined the term the global village was suddenly relevant again. And uh, this cover from Rolling Stone in the 90s is pretty uh, endemic of the postmodern irony of that period. We've got McLuhan superimposed on a, a thug life, uh, Tupac looking character, but um, yeah, we rediscovered McLuhan because a lot of what he said was really prescient about what we could expect as we moved into the 21st century and in terms of our technology and how we interact with it. So, um, you know, he wrote a number of books uh, over the course of his career, probably his name is attached to, I think, about a dozen books, but really two of them stand out if you wanted to really do a deep dive into his work, which was the Gutenberg Galaxy and Understanding Media, where he really sort of uh, honed his theories on media. Um, pretty tough reads for someone who's never read him. He's a bit obtuse in some of his language, um, but really became more well known for a lot of the very quotable quotes from many of those books. And I just share a smattering of them here as a sort of preface for what we're going to explore here. And for those of us who are interested in the culture war that we're so interested in, he wrote in the early 60s that World War III is a guerrilla information war with no division between military and civilian participation, uh, which sounds very much like the world we've been living in the last decade, doesn't it? Um, one of his other quotes, you know, we shape our tools and they shape us, something Mark is gonna help us to understand. Um, and some other quotes that are really interesting, uh, but in the, in the interest of time, I'm gonna move and just introduce uh, our guest today, Mark Stallman. He's the founder and president for the Center of, for the Study of Digital Life. Um, and he has a very interesting background. Um, he's the founder and president. And then, you know, his bio says that he's a retired Wall Street technology strategist, investment banker, and serial entrepreneur. Um, and if you dig deeper into his bio, you find he has an educational background in both theology and molecular genetics. And when you talk with Mark, you realize that he's one of those sort of modern uh, polymaths who can speak uh, at great depth on a very broad range of topics. And fortunately for us, one of those is the media theories of Marshall McLuhan. So invited him to come share his insights here at the STOA and he has generously agreed. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and welcome 
Mark to unmute himself and introduce himself to the Stoa. Welcome, Mark. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Daljeet, uh, and uh, thank you very much, Peter, um, for organizing all of this. I'm really looking forward uh, to the conversation and the Q&A that follows. Um, let me add a couple of things that uh, uh, Daljeet did not mention. Um, uh, first, uh, on McLuhan. McLuhan uh, got his uh, PhD granted from Cambridge University in 1943. Um, it was actually written at St. Louis University, a Jesuit school in the Midwest. And uh, he had to send multiple copies by different boats during World War II uh, to hope uh, that the manuscript would actually find its way back to the UK, uh, given the submarine warfare of the time. The title of that PhD uh, thesis is the classical trivium. And, uh, and so that is uh, a topic that, uh, as Dalji correctly uh, identified, really did not come into its own until um, the medieval uh, period. And, and by that, I specifically mean uh, Charlemagne. Uh, and so the division of uh, rhetoric, uh, dialectics, and grammar, where McLuhan identified himself very strongly as a grammarian, perhaps not surprising for an English professor, that became the curriculum uh, that uh, the monk Alcuin uh, pursued on behalf of Charlemagne's efforts uh, to, in fact, Christianize the Europe that had not yet been Christianized. So Charlemagne becomes the first Holy Roman Emperor. This is a context in which to think about McLuhan. Uh, I will also just note, we'll get back and talk about this, but as it turns out, the specific quote, we shape our tools and thereafter they shape us, um, that is not a Marshall McLuhan quote, but it is close to him. Um, that is a quote by um, John uh, Culkin, who invited McLuhan to spend a sabbatical year in uh, 68 at Fordham. So McLuhan was in New York in, in 68. Um, I don't recall if that was exactly the time, but he was a famous guy for sure. And so we had fascinating interviews with Timothy Leary, uh, John Lennon, and so forth. And so we should contextualize McLuhan in, in that uh, context. There are probably a few people on the screen uh, like me who are old enough to have remembered uh, the 60s. It's actually possible uh, to remember uh, what happened. I'm 73 years old, born in 1948. And so let me just add to my bio uh, one item that may be of some interest. Uh, that is uh, my own family background. As it turns out, my father was a protege of Norbert Wiener. Norbert Wiener, if you uh, have been following the bouncing ball on this, uh, is typically given the credit for having um, uh, promoted the notion of cybernetics. In fact, his uh, uh, initial book titled Cybernetics was published in 1948, the same year that I was born. What many people don't know about Norbert Wiener is that he then followed it up, and you can get the sense of this in the introduction to the 1948 book. In 1950, he followed it up with a very important book, uh, which unfortunately is you're not going to be able to read in its original version, because there's no um, example of the 1950 human use of human beings uh, that I could find online. It turns out that Norbert Wiener um, upset uh, the apple cart so severely by writing that book that he wound up being threatened uh, by the FBI with uh, him and everybody that he'd ever worked with being brought in front of HUAC, the House on American Activities Committee. And on behalf of his friends, not himself, he backed away from that. And uh, then he launched privately something I, I'm sure many of you would be uh, also interested in, kind of an invisible college that he uh, termed uh, the Genius Project. Um, Norbert Wiener himself was a boy genius, homeschooled by his father, the philologist uh, Leo uh, Wiener. And uh, as a result of all of this, uh, in 1964, when Norbert Wiener died, climbing the steps uh, uh, in Stockholm to get a prize from uh, Queen Christina, died of a heart attack. He, he was a relatively um, 
uh, big round um, uh, character and uh, climbing a, a big long set of steps for theatrical effect was probably a bad idea. Um, that ended his life. Uh, and it was at that point that my father turned to me, uh, hearing this come across the radio, and said, Mark, now you're going to have to uh, carry this project forward. Uh, and so the human use of human beings, which I surely did not understand at the age of 16, and I'm still trying to figure this out, has been uh, as assigned to me by my father and hopefully uh, at least in part being uh, carried out uh, with the Center for the Study of Digital Life and, and the rest of our activities. Uh, and I say our because uh, I think in dialogue. I'm not one of these people who goes off and writes uh, elaborate works and, and then uh, throws them over the transom. I need to work with other people and the center is the way that this has been working. And uh, I have a, uh, uh, probably uh, uh, 30 plus uh, uh, colleagues who are closely working with me in a larger uh, circle of people, which brings me to the last point I wanted to make before launching into uh, the McLuhan uh, sense-making element of this, which is that we are now living through a quite remarkable uh, a crisis that has been turned into a meta crisis. Uh, I've just come back from a uh, rather eclectic and uh, private conference in Las Vegas, uh, where a whole string of people got up and addressed what they think this elephant looks like. And to be sure, uh, we have uh, some people talking about uh, trunks and tails and tusks and so forth. But the elephant uh, in the uh, in the parlor, so to speak is a level of crisis that, that people have not felt for a very long time. Um, the last crisis at this level is not the counterculture that some of us have either personally experienced or uh, had a chance uh, to reflect upon because our parents perhaps uh, lived through it. Um, that was mild in comparison to what's happening today. Uh, string of assassinations, uh, Martin Luther King, the Kennedys and so forth, um, maybe more a reflection of the fact um, that people hadn't even figured there would be uh, such a crisis. And so therefore, they didn't uh, put fences up around the US Capitol to try to stop this from happening. But those fences are an indication of how severe uh, people are beginning to take this. And so there are multiple approaches to dealing with this meta crisis. What you're going to hear today uh, is um, a summary of one of those approaches, the approach that we're taking at the center. And I, I would say that that um, approach is grounded in uh, medieval uh, philosophy and uh, the, particularly a, a Western medieval understanding of the world in which they live. But that's not by any means the only approach. And probably it's one you're least familiar with. My guess is that this audience is, is quite familiar um, with uh, the work of, of Daniel Schmachtenberger and his uh, colleagues. <clears throat> they have taken a civilizational um, uh, research approach, as they call it, uh, which results, as best I can tell, in what they might call an anti-fragile globalism, because their uh, approach begins with complexity science. Uh, that is not our approach. Um, secondly, you may be familiar with the work of, of Lena Anderson uh, in Copenhagen. Um, Lena describes her uh, work as a Bildung, uh, which is an attempt to come to a, uh, uh, an approach that, that encompasses everything uh, off of uh, using the German word, not Danish word. And uh, she's a member of the Club of Rome. And uh, so her work is, is also related to Tomas Bjorkman. Um, and uh, that is, uh, I think, an, another uh, avenue and some of you may be familiar with. Um, uh, thirdly, uh, we have, uh, or fourthly, actually, uh, so we've got uh, medieval uh, philosophy, the center. We've got complexity science uh, with Daniel. Um, we've got a, a very deep understanding of, of history uh, in the Club of Rome and with Lena. And then fourthly, the one that probably is most obvious, which is the post-human, transhuman uh, approach to all these things. And 
I suspect that I've left some others out and I'm only talking about the English speaking world. So there, there are other approaches to this in China, India, Japan. There are likely to be dozens of distinct approaches to this meta crisis. So I'm gonna to describe uh, to you today is, uh, is our uh, approach to all of these things. Uh, it turns out that uh, McLuhan's work wound up in a book that was not actually on the screen uh, that Dalji presented to us, in a book called The Laws of Media. Um, after his uh, big splash in the 60s, as Dalji described it, uh, very correctly, um, he pretty much was pushed off the radar screen in the 70s. I would actually attribute the McLuhan revival uh, to the fact that Kevin Kelly made McLuhan the patron saint of Wired magazine when Wired was launched in the early 90s. That then afforded the opportunity for many of McLuhan's works, including his PhD thesis, to finally be published. So there's an there's a, a enormous amount of McLuhan material that has come out uh, much more recently. But I would say the anchor of all of that is Laws of Media, the New Science. That book was published in 1988. Um, I'm actually uh, looking at, at how fast my lips are moving. And I know that we have a relatively limited time here, but I'm going to try to uh, turn my rheostat down as we get into the McLuhan part of this. Uh, I'm still on something of an adrenaline high, I, I think, from going uh, uh, to Vegas and turning around and coming back in a couple of days. Flew back in a private jet. Uh, you might well imagine that, that there are a lot of people out there who don't want to deal with TSA, don't want to deal with masks, don't want to deal with all of that. And so I happened to hook up with a, with a fellow who uh, had chartered a jet. And uh, that covered, so the conversation continued late into the night on Sunday. So I'm still trying to slow my pace down uh, from all of that. Uh, it, it turns out that laws of media is, for those who are um, up for it, probably the right place to start in trying to understand McLuhan because the rest of it winds up being, um, as McLuhan would say, the formal cause of any work of art is its audience. So I am taking the faces that I see and don't see uh, on the screen here. I'm taking what I know about Daljit, what I've heard about the Stoa uh, as my audience to whom I'm trying to speak today. The audience that McLuhan uh, spoke to was a counterculture, uh, 1960s audience. But by the time we get to laws of media in 88, he had already died in 1980. So it was the decades worth of work with his son, Eric, who unfortunately uh, uh, died uh, recently, was a fellow at my center and somebody who I uh, consider to be a friend. Um, I'm hoping actually that his uh, uh, grandson, Eric's son, Andrew, um, has either joined us or will have a chance to um, listen uh, to this at, as it uh, uh, heads out into the ether. Um, Andrew is, is now at the center of uh, McLuhan scholarship. He's at the center of understanding uh, his family's contribution. Um, he's brilliant. And uh, so I, I want to also direct you to the McLuhan Institute, all one word, uh, dot com, which is Andrew's um, uh, effort. Uh, we work together closely, um, so I'm not trying to divide things up here, but the laws of media winds up in um, something which I think there will be a slide you will see later on, uh, which is the Tetrad. The Tetrad is specifically designed to retrieve what uh, the literature would ref refer to as medieval exegesis. And so the way that the medievals approach the topic of understanding the world, and in particular understanding nature, was through a four-fold simultaneous analogical uh, set of relationships. Uh, the, the book Laws of Media and its various spin-offs uh, treats this uh, very uh, succinctly. Uh, uh, it may even be somewhat easier to read because it was written largely by Eric and not by Marshall. 
Uh, but there are many mysteries, nonetheless, that are hidden um, with, within all of this. Uh, probably the best way that I could introduce that aspect of what's going on here would be to uh, tell you that if you're interested in sequential developments, and, and so what we're now dealing with um, in terms of this metacrisis is simultaneously, if you will, diachronic, so it's happening in time, but it happens also to be synchronic. It also happens to be occurring across time. The four quadrants of the McLuhan Tetrad as a heuristic, which are meant to be a way of understanding the uh, effects of any artifact on uh, human beings. So th this is not a, a specific a historical analysis, but it is much more in the medieval uh, framework. Let us understand uh, the world in which we live and how it has um, uh, impacted, uh, affected our lives. And in order to do that, we will also talk uh, today a bit about Aristotle's four causes. Um, the causality uh, behind the changes and the crisis, metacrisis in which we're now living uh, is really uh, essential. As Aristotle uh, correctly noted, and I'm not sure that his mentor Plato would have disagreed, to understand something, you must understand its causes. Um, we have unfortunately, um, all of us here, lived our lives in a world devoid of causality. The um, effort to expunge a, a thorough understanding of causality, I would attribute initially to the printing press and the effects uh, it had on society. Um, obviously, Gutenberg is 15th century, but it turns out to be uh, 16th century, which is where Marshall ends his uh, PhD thesis, classical trivium, uh, in Elizabethan England. Uh, it turns out 16th and 17th century is, is really given the pace at which things moved in those days, um, much slower than the way that we work today. It took a while. Uh, and this uh, effect of printing press, in particular, the linearity uh, of the printing press and the, the birth of progress uh, as a result that came out of that. We see those effects still all around us. The transition from a scribal world, which is another way to describe a medieval world, uh, that scribal to print transition um, uh, took a couple of centuries. It did not happen at the same time in all places. Many places, um, for instance, uh, I will cite Sweden. Sweden effectively had no literacy. It was a scribal world until uh, the printing press arrived with the Bible. And it was the printing uh, of the Bible in Swedish that effectively made that transition. Um, that happened uh, earlier than the same transition in, for instance, Japan and China. And so the scribal world uh, in the West um, got truncated earlier, uh, that transition uh, from scribal to print it is an enormously uh, uh, impactful, uh, changing everything uh, about our lives. Um, we still tend to talk about the Descartes and the Kants and so forth of the world. Uh, that is uh, part of that transition in dealing with it. The later transition from the print world uh, which I typically date uh, to 1550. Um, that transition to an electric world, which is the world we've all lived in, happened uh, roughly in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, yes, here we go. Thank you. Um, and so uh, in, in the language that we use, uh, identifying for tribal and literate, um, Tribal would be something you would find in our literature as a uh, all caps oral world. Literate, uh, you would find in some things that we've written as all caps scribal, then followed by all caps print, 
then followed by all caps electric. And what we are now living through it, um, is the transition um, from electric to digital. These are the, the big um, breakpoints in uh, every human civilization. They don't necessarily occur at the same time. I will highlight uh, two references for you without uh, going into this much more deeply. Um, in particular, I will draw your attention to those who have uh, written about. Um, uh, I will get to the topic of the psychedelic age, uh, which is not the future. In fact, the psychedelic age uh, was a very electric uh, phenomenon, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, but I want to draw your attention uh, to uh, the uh, author Julian Jaynes, you may be familiar with, um, at one point, uh, a uh, psychology professor. Uh, Bill has got a finger up. Um, you, you want to ask a question, Bill? Or uh, we will have a fairly lengthy Q&A. Julian, Julian Jaynes. Oh, you just pointed to Julian Jaynes. Oh, yeah, there you go. Okay. Aristotle, Aquinas, Jaynes, and McLuhan. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to have an extensive Q&A uh, at the end of all of this. So uh, Bill is a, a close colleague of mine, and uh, he's got a green screen. Everybody who, who wants to uh, have to do this stuff, uh, just get yourself a green screen, and you can throw up any graphics you want behind you. Um, much better than, than how Zoom does this. Um, so it, it turns out that Julian Jaynes, as a psychology professor at uh, Princeton, wrote The Origins of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. Uh, that's a very rich territory in which to consider the transition um, from oral to scribal. Uh, I will also note for you a uh, man who picked that ball up and ran with it uh, by the name of Merlin Donald. He is a retired um, uh, neuro uh, uh, psychoanthropologist, uh, somebody we also have worked with. So those are two references for that transition. And there are uh, there's piles of others. Um, this was effectively the transition that gave us the world's great religions. This is effectively the transition that gave us, therefore, sacred books. And sacred books are the basis of those great religions. And this transition then brought about what we would probably recognize as civilization. Uh, we are now in the midst of the next great transition. So I will indicate to you that um, uh, Merlin Donald, uh, who is still with us and thought about this perhaps more than anybody else, um, has been struggling since I met him uh, now uh, almost 25 years ago to characterize what we are uh, already now going through. Um, this crisis, metacrisis and, and beyond, uh, it is a, at root, is a fundamental uh, change in the underlying communications technologies by which we come to understand the grammar of the world in which we live. Uh, the counterculture, which probably many would uh, relate to, uh, and the, the question about uh, a psychedelic age um, is uh, very much what I would expect from this audience as well as others. Um, that was an electric age retrieval of oral. So I'll explain in a second what retrieval actually means. Um, but I will note for you, it is not what we are dealing with uh, today. Um, when I got up at the Las Vegas uh, conference and recognizing to some degree the audience I was speaking to and deciding that I was, I was going to pull the pin out and roll the hand grenade across the floor, uh, I noted, and I know this is now uh, a public record, um, which that was not, um, I was an underground chemist at one point in my life and uh, later became uh, what some have referred to as the alternate historian of LSD. Um, so these are topics that I have some knowledge about. Uh, I was not an LSD chemist. Uh, LSD was already illegal by the time uh, I got the skill. Uh, but the things that I was involved with were not uh, illegal. So I never broke the law with any of my uh, synthetic chemistry. I'm proud to report. And as a result of that, I wound up on all sorts of, of uh, watch lists, uh, nonetheless. Um, uh, so I haven't escaped that, uh, that part of my background, I suspect. Um, so let me, uh, let me now jump into the topic of the tetrad, since I've been pointing you to laws of media 
and been pointing you uh, to the importance of the Tetrad as sort of the final expression of McLuhan's work. Uh, the, uh, the Tetrad, as I've indicated, has four quadrants. These are not meant to be one after the other. So this is not a linear sequence, although there is some sequencing that goes on here. Um, it is meant to be an all at once, just as uh, Aristotle's uh, four causes were all at once. And so very briefly here, um, we can go into some of this in Q&A if you'd like, uh, or you can take this as a uh, uh, motivation to go read the original materials. Um, along comes uh, a new artifact, a new technology. And now we're trying to explore the impact of that technology uh, on uh, individuals as well as society. And it begins, of course, with uh, the question of uh, what is being enhanced. What is this technology promoting? Uh, what is it trying to push uh, into the forefront uh, of our subconscious? I will get to that topic after the uh, Tetrad. I'll come back to the, the, the topic of uh, how human beings uh, actually wind up organizing their lives, which I would guess most people on screen here realize is not intellectual, is not rational, uh, but in fact is analogical and subconscious. So McLuhan would very much have, have made that point. And so what, what happens to our subconscious grasp of the grammar of the world around us when new technologies are introduced and, and begin to become overwhelming, dominant, habitually dominant in our lives? It begins with what they enhance. But as, as McLuhan uh, would, of course, stress, the um, enhance is paired with what it obsolesces. And here, obsolete does not mean a disappearance. It actually means an amplification, as uh, paradoxical as that might seem. So what happens is that the new technology forces the older framework to become uh, agitated. And it winds up having uh, to assert itself even more strongly in our lives. We now have, uh, as uh, many here no doubt know, uh, we're on the cusp of the approval of a variety of psychedelics as medical treatment, um, not as uh, a spiritual exploration, but as uh, treatment for PTSD and so forth. So um, this is the older uh, framework, the electric framework, now um, getting out from underneath the prohibitions of the 60s and, uh, and becoming uh, mainstream um, psychological treatments, which is what, in fact, they were uh, before um, many who were involved with that think Tim Leary screwed the pooch, uh, so to speak, and, uh, and made everybody uh, so upset about this. So enhanced and obsolesce are probably fairly straightforward. The third um, uh, element here, third quadrant, uh, maybe somewhat less uh, obvious, but it is implied with the fact that this is a dynamic process. Uh, and in fact, uh, the limits of everything are built into the phenomena from the very, very beginning. And those limits um, are what we're now seeing with the approval of psychedelic therapies and so forth. That's the limits of the electric phenomena, so to speak. And the way the McLuhan's described this is that they discovered about every single artifact they could look at, um, automobiles, light bulbs, on and on. And, and those, uh, the book I just mentioned has a long list of these and describing them. By the way, I should note for you that we're dealing here with analogy and metaphor. We're, we're not dealing with logic. As a grammarian, McLuhan would be among the first to say there is no simple logical answer. There are many analogical answers. And so uh, what was written in the book, can anybody can go in and substitute as they'd like and, and their own reflections. But those three, to some extent, line up with what we're all familiar with in, in terms of, of uh, uh, if you will, um, uh, dialectical materialism. Um, uh, I recently did a um, uh, interview of this sort, presentation, in front of a group of Russian uh, futurists. Uh, some of my friends in, in Moscow set that up, uh, very interesting group. And what I did not know until after that is that 
despite the fact that, that the Soviet Union um, is gone, uh, despite the fact that the Communist Party uh, uh, of Russia, while it still uh, ha- exists and polls votes, um, is not a political force, uh, every high school student and college student is repeatedly instructed to this day in a version of dialectical materialism, which is to say the uh, often and incorrectly attributed to Hegel, the Hegelian, in quotes, construct um, of uh, thesis, which would be corresponding to obsolescence, uh, and antithesis, which would correspond to enhances, the new technology, um, and then the, the, the synthesis, the, uh, the result of putting all these pieces together. And, and that would correspond to the McLuhan quadrant of verses. So what's the fourth quadrant all about? And I, I want to underscore here for you that that is where it all begins. And it is by and large lacking in mo- what most of the world understands about these topics. I should also just footnote this by saying, although the Chinese adopted uh, Marxian um, and sort of fake Hegelian uh, frameworks, and you'll still see lots of of Chinese speeches about contradictions and all the rest of it. Uh, None of this corresponds to Chinese society. The the Chinese society really has very little interest um, in this sort of linear progression. They're a a cyclically uh, uh, understood history. And and so um, you have a bit of a mismatch there. But what is retrieval? Retrieval is what brings in, if you will, the cyclical dimension, what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is uh, bringing back what seems to have been discarded, bringing back something which uh, um, would have been predicted as we'll never see that again because we're linear and we're progressive and we keep moving along and everything keeps getting better. Well. As uh, you would know, uh, psychedelics really have nothing to do with the scribal age. They have nothing to do with the print age. They are a retrieval of the oral age um, before uh, literacy. And and so I I won't belabor this. Maybe some will come up in the um, Q&A as this uh, simulates your interest in the topic. But if if you do want to take the McLuhan Uh, synchronic, all four happening at once, and then try to shift it over to a diachronic, what is the time uh, sequence here? You want to add a time dimension uh, to all of this. Um, The way we would describe it is that we are leaving behind now uh, a world that has been dominated uh, grammatically by television, and entering into a world that is now grammatically dominated by a radically different structure. That that is a series of structures, the structures associated with digital. And so if you are interested in the McLuhan um, uh, treatment of these topics, uh, you can open up um, his uh, uh, sons. His name is first, but, um, and they worked on it for much of the 1970s, but it was an Eric McLuhan uh, production. Um, you can take a look at that, and it will, uh, uh, in particular, I would draw your attention uh, to television uh, and the computer, which are the two most obvious uh, artifacts of these um, environments. We would call them uh, psychotechnological environments. And you will find in the obsolesce quadrant of television, as was published in 1988, the words, the inner trip. And I'm sure the inner trip could be expanded on by many people here, but that was the, uh, that was the final expression, if you will, of the uh, electric framework uh, as shown to us by television. And the inner trip, of course, today, um, everyone would recognize that as being Facebook and Instagram and all the rest of the stuff, the sort of stuff that, um, uh, uh, that Tristan Harris and, and Roger McNamee and so forth uh, portrayed in The Social Dilemma. None of that is digital. Uh, it is in transition, certainly, but it is sort of the last and final stage of television where everybody gets to be a television broadcaster. 
if you contrast that with the retrieval quadrant as printed again in 1988 in Laws of Media, but now you're looking at the retrieval quadrant of computers, which is the closest we're gonna come in that work to the digital world in which we now live, the retrieval quadrant, which is to say, what is the, um, what is the reservoir uh, in human history that this new uh, uh, technology is drawing upon? Um, and that would, it turns out, uh, absolutely fascinating uh, presentation. Um, and I will note for you, there are multiple published and some unpublished answers to the question uh, of what uh, computers retrieve. Um, so I, I don't think that McLuhan was entirely um, of one mind about this, but what it says is perfect memory, total and exact. So what I wanna focus on here very briefly is what happens to people when their subconscious, um, recognizing the grammar of the world in which they live, operating on the basis of the inner trip, has now been transitioned into perfect memory. Uh, and so in uh, terms of the psychology, which we have retrieved at the center, um, which is to say um, uh, medieval, in particular Thomistic faculty psychology, um, this means that we have now transitioned uh, from a world in which imagination dominates our interests and our concerns. And I would be very surprised if there aren't a bunch of people on the screen who have written about and thought a great deal about the importance of the imagination. It was the electric environment that pushed the imagination to the point of fantasy. So we are transitioning from a fantasy driven world into one which is memory driven. Um, so I don't know, Daji, if you want to throw up the uh, um, graphic uh, about faculty psychology here. Uh, we are very uh, strongly committed, and we may be unique amongst the various um, uh, meta-crisis narratives uh, that I had uh, I previously uh, referenced um, in my introduction. I think we're probably uh, uniquely uh, inclined to discard modern psychology um, with extreme prejudice. Um, I noted for you early on that my uh, father was a protege and therefore I become a kind of a godchild of Norbert Wiener and cybernetics. And I think a significant part of what happened to Wiener in his human use of human beings is that he was fighting against what ultimately uh, took over in the field of psychology. Uh, Wiener was a, a mathematician, uh, and, uh, but as a, as a child, he'd been raised by his philologist uh, father, homeschooled effectively we call it today. And that was a, um, uh, as a secular uh, Jew, uh, it, it might surprise you that his uh, upbringing was actually uh, uh, Russian Orthodoxy. And the reason for that was because his father was a philologist uh, of Slavic languages. And, um, and so therefore, Norbert Wiener grew up on a diet of Dostoevsky and Tolstoy. Um, and so that led him to very different conclusions. He did not want to see um, the human um, uh, psyche uh, to be um, uh, turned into uh, something which could be programmed. The human human beings uh, from uh, from Wiener that got him in so much trouble uh, is, uh, in fact, uh, all right, you ready to that? Sorry for that interruption. Oh, get out of here. Okay. Why don't I turn my phone off? See if that works. Uh, 
it 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 turns out that uh, uh, the human human beings would have completely stopped the uh, the field of cybernetics as it ultimately developed, and so the cyberneticians who threw um, Wiener under the bus um, knew what they were dealing with. Cognitive psychology, which I suspect is accepted in one level or another by most approaches to this meta crisis is something that we have um, aggressively discarded. Um, and so uh, because it's not human, um, attempting to pattern human beings and in particular their psyche, uh, attempting to pattern that on computers is a, is a fundamental mistake, but is understood if you approach the, sub, the subject as one of attempting uh, to um, program uh, or engineer humans, which is the world in which we've lived and, and probably tried to resist as best we could. Faculty psychology here, and, and, and then I think with, given the timing of this, I'm probably gonna have to wrap up with, um, uh, with some discussion of the four causes. Um, but just here very briefly, and you can find out much more about this by going to uh, digital uh, life. So that means two L's dot center, which is the URL uh, uh, for uh, Center for the Study of Digital Life. We have a journal entitled uh, Dianoeticon. And so you will find a um, 200 plus page treatment with new old reprinted uh, essays on the topic you see in front of you. And so instead of there being cog uh, cognitive psychology, by and large, accepts the views of a, a researcher by the name of J.J. Uh, uh, Gibson. And J.J. Gibson has proposed that there is something called direct perception, which is to say from our external senses, um, the uh, data uh, winds up then directly moving into our computational capabilities, which would be called the intellect. That is about as wrong as you could possibly imagine. And the results of that approach um, in significant part are an extremely confused, uh, depressed, and often suicidal uh, population who've been treated on that basis. Instead of that, there is an enormously rich element in the middle of the sandwich. So you might view this as an Oreo cookie uh, in which uh, some people have attempted to remove um, the double stuff in the middle. So all you wind up with uh, is the bread uh, and there's no meat in the sandwich uh, to use the sandwich analogy. Um, the common sense is the integrator of our external senses. Doesn't have to be five. You can keep on adding as many as you want, but they will all wind up being collated uh, in what uh, was understood roughly from the time of Aristotle until experimental psychology turned us all into a lab rats in the 19th century, was understood as having uh, a faculty of this sort. That faculty is, is working right now in all of us. We're, we're all trying to, to sort out uh, what's going on here. You've got some images, you've got my voice, um, you, you've got uh, some graphics. You're trying to somehow make sense out of all of this, uh, which is ultimately the sense-making point of this uh, entire presentation. Uh, it is uh, uh, running at uh, the fastest speed that uh, can be accomplished, and so it has to shove things off to the side and store them as images. Uh, and so this is what the medievals uh, and before had called the imaginative uh, faculty. Um, but that's not good enough because in fact, we have no patterns yet. We have no time stamps yet. We don't have anything that could be useful for our lives in just our imagination. Um, I'm not for by any means suggesting that we should try to uh, suppress or eliminate, um, if we even could, which we can, uh, our imagination. But what I am suggesting that if you stop at the imagination, um, then you have made human beings um, enormously vulnerable. And in fact, you've shifted them uh, into uh, a world uh, that, uh, um, makes humans uh, in some sense programmable because you can supply them with images 
of um, non-reality, which of course is what television does. So television is a blinking light uh, puppet show. And uh, it was deliberately designed, if you will, uh, to confuse us uh, via our imagination and by eliminating memory. Um, in fact, if you want patterns, if you want to make sense, if you want to overcome a meaning crisis, imagination can never accomplish that for you. Instead, what is needed are the other two critical elements. I probably should come up with some analogy that has to do with uh, various components of a sandwich and whether we're dealing with the, uh, the mustard or the cheese or, or the underlying uh, ham in the sandwich. Um, but in any event, none of this works without uh, pattern recognition or what McLuhan would have called percepts. And uh, those percepts are formed in what is known as the cogitative sense, which otherwise has the name particular reason. Now I realize this is all the new vocabulary for you. This is not something that anybody outside of very specialized groups have ever been trained in. They've been trained in the philosophy associated with this, not with the social implications of this, so in this regard, I would direct you uh, to our ecology of the inner senses in our journal Dianoeticon on our website. Let me return here now um, before we go into Q&A with the causality dimension of all of this. You cannot understand anything unless you understand its causes. But unfortunately, we have been um, unless we uh, happen to have particular forms of education, we have been robbed of our understanding of causality. By the way, the typical cause and effect, uh, which uh, would seem to be a part of our own um, general approach to life, or what I might call the billiard ball uh, version uh, of uh, causality, uh, that would be what we've come to call the efficient cause. Um, if you were to actually use Aristotle's Greek and translate it anew, it would probably be called the kinetic uh, cause. But in any event, it has been replaced in many crucial areas, particularly those areas having to do with sense-making, particular areas having to do with the crisis of meaning. It's been replaced by statistics. So in addition to being uh, extremely prejudiced uh, against um, uh, cognitive psychology and all of its offshoots, we have the same general attitude about statistics. And, and as a result of that, you will find in the mission statement uh, for the Center for the Study of Digital Life, our intent to replace effectively all of today's social sciences. Uh, the other... Uh, Three causes, which have been under attack now for uh, 400 years. By the way, the, 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 the last uh, cause standing, efficient cause, being replaced by statistics is a phenomenon that occurred in the late 19th century, uh, moving into the 20th century. So this is a, a relatively recent phenomenon. The other three causes, material, formal, and final cause, um, came under vicious attack uh, starting uh, in the uh, 16th century uh, aggressively, and then the Enlightenment effectively wiped them out. Um, yes, uh, because this causality and Aristotle was associated with the Roman Catholic Church. And as you know, the, the overall uh, shift associated with print um, moved us into a world uh, in which the, the church and everything associated with it now had to be resisted. Um, that is no longer the case, um, as you might tell from some of the things that we've, we've written. Uh, material cause uh, is what we would now call complexity science. Uh, material cause began, um, I'm sorry, complexity science, as you might know, uh, began uh, to be particularly uh, aggressively promoted by the Santa Fe Institute. The Santa Fe Institute um, to this day receives a very substantial annual stipend, no questions asked from the US Energy Department. It was founded by the people who own and make the bombs. Um, the overall uh, issue here uh, is that uh, 
uh, an attempt to unify science uh, around the underlying uh, physics of bomb making has now been translated uh, into an attempt um, to describe society in the same way. That, that attempt has failed, um, but that doesn't stop um, people from moving forward uh, as if it might somehow uh, be made to work. So material cause has been revived in our lifetimes, um, but in, in a way that is disjoint from all the other causes. Um, final cause uh, is it, a fascinating topic. The history of final, final uh, history of final cause is something I can't uh, do here today. But I would draw your attention here to Charles Sanders Peirce and the uh, origins of semiotics um, and the fact that he, Peirce, who is not well understood, believed himself to be drawing upon medieval sources, it will not surprise you that Final Cause features very importantly in his work. But for us, the most important component here is formal cause. And formal cause, uh, Daljit had, had actually sent me a couple of slides associated with uh, Final Cause, I'm sorry, Formal Cause, and I asked him to revise it. So there, there are gonna be some graphics here that are familiar, I think to some of the folks in, in the audience here. Um, formal cause is the human soul. The faculties that I was just describing are faculties of the soul. The soul, as you might suspect, has largely been um, surgically removed from our cultural lives. One potentially important um, exception to that uh, might be Kanye West. Um, Kanye um, has, of, of course, uh, uh, shifted uh, based upon his career uh, from being a, a rapper, which was a, a electric uh, era, uh, a sort of approach to, to this, uh, all these topics, uh, to becoming a gospel singer which is the uh, origins uh, of, of his, his life. His, his, he grew up with that. And so the slogan, Kanye for president, um, is not a joke. Um, to have a gospel singer uh, trying to bring formal cause, the soul, remembering here, um, uh, Debbie Newman is, is on this uh, call. Uh, Debbie and I have been together for 25 years. She's out of the music industry. Um, uh, 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 absolutely uh, brilliant on these topics. And I remember conversations with her about Soul Train. Uh, Cornelius' Soul Train, which some of you may have, have seen. I don't know if you could even find that uh, nowadays. But uh, Soul Music. Uh, will be one of the avenues by which we recover the soul. So the formal cause of human beings, uh, psyche is the Greek word, anima is the Latin word, soul is the English language word, and uh, this is at the heart of what we are now struggling with. Uh, transcendence, um, a topic that I think uh, Daljit has spent a good deal of his life uh, looking at, uh, corresponds to um, final cause. And um, uh, this, uh, this graphic uh, could be replaced with any number of other uh, ways of approaching this. And it, it may be that that's the more electric version. The digital version may look a bit different than that. But that all I'm really trying to stress for you here now is that we, we're tossing the 20th century out. It's no longer serving our purposes. Um, it's obsolescence, as McLuhan would have described it, uh, has been crushing. Uh, it has been um, uh, a cause of enormous uh, uh, concern, um, uh, death, uh, and destruction in our lives. Uh, we're moving beyond that. Um, I didn't get a chance in this because McLuhan, um, this is the McLuhan sense making session. And hopefully in the Q&A, we will have an opportunity to talk a bit about uh, artificial intelligence. Um, but I will tell you that under digital conditions, the condition to which we now live, the number one question has become, what does it mean to be human? Not for all of the reasons that this has been lingering in our lives and, and our ancestors' lives, but because we're now so radically far down the road 
towards inventing artificial humans. It is the design of artificial humans, uh, often mistakenly identified as artificial intelligence, ultimately, of course, to accomplish anything even approximating um, the views of the singularity and so forth that Ray Kurzweil and others have promoted. We're talking about building artificial souls, not artificial intelligence, artificial souls. Uh, so I'll draw your attention here to one particular book. Um, the title of it is Artificial Humanity. It's written by um, uh, a priest in uh, uh, Rome. He happens to have grown up in Silicon Valley, so he winds up being sort of the go-between um, between uh, the Pope and uh, 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 Reed Hoffman and uh, others like that, uh, literally the one who makes those introductions. Uh, his name is, is Father Philip Larry, um, L-A-R-R-E-Y. Um, so uh, check that out if you'd like to as well. The big challenge which we are now dealing with to do as I often do in these presentations is to take the end of it now and tie it back to the beginning of it. Um, this has not been a linear presentation. This has been a circular presentation. And the circle closes here by my suggesting to you that everything that Norbert Wiener, my godfather, was concerned about in the early days, everything that led to his fellow cyberneticians to throw him under the bus, uh, is now come home to roost. The greatest concern which we will have of going forward will be a concern uh, about um, whether humanity uh, can survive. Um, the artificial humanity that we're now in the process of designing. Um, Marshall McLuhan was uh, often asked uh, if he was an optimist or a pessimist. Um, I noticed that some of you, I've already put some of you to sleep uh, with what I'm saying here. Um, and so I'm not sure where that uh, uh, arises on that scale. But um, Marshall's answer to that question was, um, neither. I am an apocalypsist. And as you probably uh, have heard, apocalypse does not mean the end of the world. That would be the eschaton. And eschatology uh, is the study uh, of what many people think to be the apocalypse. Apocalypse is another word for revelation. So for us to address sense-making, the task which we have all been given now is to attend to revelation in all of its aspects. Uh, and uh, while I am neither a pessimist nor an optimist about the ability of humanity uh, to survive uh, this new challenge, which is a brand new one, um, for the patterns were recognized by my godfather, Norbert Wiener. Uh, they have largely been suppressed. Um, they are now, uh, once again, uh, coming to the fore. And uh, it will be impossible for us to avoid this. My overall view is that humanity will be compelled to answer the question, what is a human? The robots will make us do that. And the various uh, meta narratives that I opened up with in my introduction are at the moment the human response uh, to this question of revelation. Uh, I think that probably wraps up in a circular fashion what I started out to say to you. Um, I thank you all very much uh, for your, uh, well, not all of you, but most of you for your attention. <laughs> and I'm very glad to take some questions now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mark. <clears throat> For anyone who's ever read McLuhan, I realize now that listening to you, Mark, is a lot like reading McLuhan. Uh, mm. you, you pull a lot of different threads together, and in the end, you tie it all together. I know it was a, a secular presentation, but connecting the dots from Aristotle to Don Cornelius to Kanye West uh, is a testament. I think that's a very uh, 21st century McLuhan move right there. So thank you, my friend. Um, yeah, trying to pack, what, 3,000 years of history into a one-hour presentation is always a challenge, um, but I think we've covered a lot of terrain here. 
Um, I know I'll be re-watching this a couple of times just to grok it all, but um, I want to pivot to Q&A and uh, you guys know the deal. If you don't mind being on camera, this is being recorded on YouTube, um, you just raise your hand and we'll put you on. If you want to have me ask the question, I'm happy to do that. We already have a few. Um, and I know, Peter, you made a comment uh, about post-human uh, world. Maybe you'd like to share that. Um, yeah, it wasn't really a question. Uh, it was um, just uh, the sense that the, the cultural worlds have like a battlefront of post-human versus pro-human. Um, and I guess I'm interested how you see that's uh, going to emerge. Right. Um, uh, I guess I, I will. I should probably uh, start out by um, being a little bit uh, contrary, if you don't mind, Peter. Um, obviously, the word emerge. Uh, has uh, many uh, historic connotations. Unfortunately, it has largely been uh, hijacked by the complexity crowd. Uh, and, and so uh, since I think com complexity is heading us in the wrong direction, I, I do my best, I'm not complaining about you, but I do, but do my best to use other words than emerge so that uh, we're not confusing this with the prescriptions of, um, of complexity. Um, the first part of the answer to the question, Peter, is that uh, engineering humans failed. They can't be engineered. Um, while life forms can be uh, bred, and uh, eugenics was, of course, the attempt to, to shift the engineering of, of, of plants and, and animals um, into humans, um, not only did eugenics fail, but the entire 20th century project of programming humans failed. As a result, you would expect some people would then figure out, well, we need to get rid of the humans. Let's come up with something better. And so uh, originally transhuman, which I knew is extropian back in my Mondo 2000 days, uh, ultimately then uh, uh, transhuman and now philosophically posthuman. This is an effort uh, to uh, move beyond humanity. Um, so this is, a, uh, uh, I think, at root, uh, a, a very understandable reaction given digital technology and artificial humanity. Um, there are a wide variety of people um, with a wide uh, range of, of views uh, on all of this. I have uh, been a part of some of these conversations. Um, you will notice that uh, Alexandra, uh, the first person, perhaps, if you ever get to the fellows page uh, of the center, uh, a, a very uh, uh, bright, brilliant, actually, uh, Polish uh, posthumanist is the first uh, of the fellows that you can find. So um, that should underscore for you that we're not approaching this ideologically. We're approaching this as a kind of an explorer's club. Uh, and uh, uh, perhaps the same as what you folks are doing to try to bring all of this uh, together. But uh, how is this going to turn out? Um, the answer is contained in the last interview that Norbert Wiener conducted in 1963 before his death, uh, climbing the stairs in uh, Stockholm. He said uh, that the, the question posed to him, which is the question that Bill is, has put behind him on his screen, the question that we've had a chance to talk about, um, will the machines replace the humans, was the question that he was asked. His answer was, yes, there was a very great danger that might happen, but it all depends on us. So we do not yet have an answer to your question, Peter, of how this is going to turn out. Um, McLuhan was often uh, uh, asked, to predict the future. And he said, I'm very happy to predict the future as long as it's already happened. And this has not yet happened. Um, I am quite confident, however, I, I do not uh, uh, mind saying this in a public forum like this, that without the retrieval of the psyche, without the retrieval of faculty psychology, we will never get anything that approximates AGI, cannot be done. Uh, as you probably know, those of you who are in the artificial intelligence field and, and for those who are looking for a link or a way to sort of keep track of this, I would recommend that you go to Stanford University's uh, Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. Um, the C has been dropped, so it's H 
AI High. The Stanford High site has a uh, remarkable uh, symposia. You get to meet all the top um, uh, artificial intelligence researchers. You get to find out that they don't, that they know they don't know what they're doing. Um, absolutely fascinating to me to see these guys argue with each other about what could possibly come next. See them argue with me about the tens of millions of dollars being spent, maybe more than that, hundreds of millions of dollars being spent on trying to give AIs what they refer to as common sense, to simply give the, them the ability to know that an elephant can't fit through a door, things that any two-year-old knows. They'll accomplish that, and they'll think that they have uh, made a significant breakthrough in the process, but they will not have. Without a really deep understanding of the human soul, which by and large, the artificial intelligence, well, not just by and large, uh, oh, uh, uniformly, I keep looking for somebody in the artificial intelligence world who has some grasp of this. I will I'll tell you with, without uh, belaboring this, that I would not be at all surprised if it will be the Chinese who accomplish this. The, the Chinese understanding of what it means to be human um, is uh, in, in some ultimate sense, uh, uh, closely parallels what Western civilization uh, came to understand, but they were never uh, forced to give it up. Um, print and electric never changed Chinese civilization to forget what they thought it meant to be a human. And by the way, what it means to be a human in some of the Chinese AI researchers I've talked with means the ability uh, to uh, correctly and effectively um, use the I Ching. Um, and uh, uh, that may be, um, uh, uh, not maybe, that will certainly be quite obscure in terms of what I'm saying. But my, um, my research on this topic has indicated that the Chinese are well ahead of the West in thinking these things through. Sorry, lo long answer to a um, simple question. Peter, I hope that was helpful. Um, just to keep the, the AI thread alive, Eric had a question uh, regarding AI. Did you want to unmute yourself, Eric, and ask your question? Yes. Uh, first of all, thanks, Mark, um, for this great talk. I'm working on a PhD project on AI in environmental science from a media theory perspective, and I'm greatly influenced by McLuhan. So okay. it's really cool to be here to talk about McLuhan. And uh, of course, I want to ask a question about AI, but first I want to draw attention to the fact that we might not know what we're actually talking about when we're using the word AI. Are we talking about linear regression or deep learning or rule-based expert systems? This, this is a right. bag that's covered by this term and it's also applied in so many areas like environmental science, public health care sector, transport, right. organization of labor. So first we might want to find a way to meaningfully frame our discussion right. and maybe uh, you have something to say about that. Yes, um, I'd, I'd like to draw your attention to a, um, a book title of which is The Myth of Artificial Intelligence. Um, uh, published, I think, in 19 uh, by a man by the name of Eric Larson. Um, I do not know Eric Larson. Um, I have not read the book, uh, but I have sat through some interviews with him, uh, which were strong enough uh, for me to um, make this recommendation. Um, there are uh, a number of published interviews with him, which may be an appropriate entry point. And exactly to what Eric has said, artificial intelligence uh, obviously means a wide variety of things to different people, um, as does indeed the word um, intelligence, and, and for that matter, artificial, <laughs> as opposed to natural. So we're, we're dealing here with metaphors in every one of these words. And uh, metaphors cannot be defined, but you can certainly uh, uh, give some effort to trying to help people understand what it is uh, you're actually dealing with. So what, he, what Eric Larson does is he says, okay, we have three different time, types of, of inference. Uh, we have, um, and I'm probably not doing him entire justice here, we have deductive inference, and that was effectively what I would call old AI, so uh, otherwise known as expert systems. So we're going to interview people. We're going to find out everything that they think they know. We're going to uh, systematize all of this, and then we're going to we're going to pr produce algorithms that can uh, that can replace the um, uh, the guy that knows how to uh, install air conditioning systems. Uh, 
the second of those, of course, would be inductive. Uh, um, and the uh, in, in, inductive approach uh, is the one, uh, as he describes it, which is largely taken over in machine learning. Um, so we have uh, in front of us the AI superpowers, as uh, Kai Fu Lee has described this. Um, I'm going to also draw people's attention uh, to his most recent book, uh, AI 2041, which has got 10 scenarios in that. Uh, some of them are, are actually quite fascinating. He had to team up with the head of the Chinese Science Fiction Writers Association, however, to write that. So computer scientists could not have written that book. That just came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, I haven't a chance to fully read it myself. But what Eric Larson then says is, no, neither one of those things are going to get you across the goal line. Um, uh, deductive inference, inductive rep, uh, um, inference, both very useful. They have their own domains. But then he goes on to say, we're going to have to master abductive inference. Abductive is a, a term that many would associate, again, with Charles Sanders Peirce. Charles Sanders Peirce um, explicitly thought that he was building his entire uh, work on the work of Duns Scotus, a uh, Franciscan um, uh, from the uh, 13th century. Um, turns out the specific work was not written by Duns Scotus. It was only later discovered after uh, Sanders' uh, uh, death, but nonetheless. And you can pick up a good deal of the implications of uh, Saunders for this purpose by reading the work of John Dealey. John Dealey was a semi semiotician, died a couple of years ago. Um, absolutely uh, brilliant in, in how he deals with this. And he particularly um, enriches the whole topic of abduction, um, which is um, a kind of inference that I would suggest is impossible without the inner senses. Many people have uh, incorrectly described uh, abduction as a kind of intuitive um, inference. Um, in, intuition is, is a weasel word that, that uh, allows us to uh, step aside from actually trying to understand the psyche. So um, my suggestion would be, as a, a potentially something helpful for you in your PhD project, would be to look at John Dealey. John Dealey's magnum opus is the four ages of understanding. Um, uh, and, and also uh, uh, to look at uh, how Peirce uh, dealt with these topics, but also take a look at our um, ecology, the inner senses, and try to put that up against them. So um, I, my answer to your question is, you will get a lot of, of tasks accomplished with expert systems and with machine learning. And, and yes, it may very well be that the best machine learning uh, relies on the largest possible data sets and, and so forth. As it turns out, the concern of the human-centered artificial intelligence people today, as best as I can tell, again, from Stanford High, um, is that, by the way, uh, there is no Stanford High School, but uh, Palo Alto High School is not far away, and it was always referred to as Pali High. Uh, and, and so Stanford High, uh, is very concerned uh, about the political correctness of the data sets that we're training uh, these bots uh, to go on. So, so that, that whole thing has, has shifted off into uh, how do we make sure, um, and of course it's already happened a bunch of times, we've, we've trained um, uh, algorithms on um, data sets of 13-year-old well, girls uh, say to each other. And uh, as you might imagine, 13-year-old girls, are, are uh, a lot of them are quite nasty. Uh, and, and and quite prejudiced, and, and so this has freaked them out. But you, you will accomplish a lot of things. And uh, uh, the other thing that is apparently in, and I, and I have not yet read the book, but a myth of, of artificial intelligence apparently goes through many, uh, he is a, a, a computer scientist and, and uh, researcher, so he's not uh, coming at this um, uh, from the outside, he's on the inside. So he will describe to you in great detail what the various companies are doing. Um, what's Google doing? Uh, what's Facebook doing? Uh, what's AI 100? Um, actually, AI 100 is currently, right now as we're talking, um, there is an AI 100 um, online uh, uh, symposium uh, being uh, sponsored by Stanford. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of this is, is going to come out in this. The latest report from the AI 100 group, uh, which was started by the um, um, 
one of the heads of research at Microsoft, uh, Eric Horvath. Um, the latest report from them illustrates how the AI field at that level has become very concerned that we're going to be uh, generating uh, racist bots. Uh, and, and so um, I suspect that is what is now being described um, on, an, on another, another channel here in our uh, 5 million channel universe in which we now live. So I hope that was helpful. Very much so, thank you very much. Thanks, I think we got time for maybe just one more question before we wrap up at the bottom of the hour. I think uh, Kevin, you had a question regarding the Tetrad that seemed interesting. Yeah, hey Mark, thanks. Um, first hey, I want to plus, one plus one, your uh, intuition is a weasel word. Um, that's, that's a good line. Um, but um, I have a question about the, the Tetrad. So in the Tetrad, you sort of have, you know, the, the obsolescence ground um, or the part that is obsolete, becomes obsolete, obsolete, yeah, whatever. Um, I'm wondering how that, like the effect of that, the Tetrad in um, like places where, if you've heard of the term leapfrogging, like that's kind of a big term in Africa. Um, right. like for example, they don't have telephone lines. Everyone's like skipping straight to 5G. I'm wondering right. like for, you know, countries and cultures with different sort of technical parts of the stage of technological development, how that sort of Tetrad changes. Because um, you could imagine that some cultures would have different grounds versus others. Right, and, and thank you very much because I um, did not uh, have the opportunity uh, here to um, discuss uh, a, another critical dimension of what we're doing, which is um, not specifically McLuhan, but um, as it turns out, uh, uh, globalism um, is now uh, obsolete. And um, what that means is that uh, the vast, vast majority of what you will read in uh, headlines um, uh, about uh, geopolitics and so forth is just flat out wrong. Um, and uh, we have actually launched a company. Um, so I think I've been billed here in, a, in addition to being the uh, president of Center for Digital Life. I'm also the CEO of a newly launched strategic advisory called Exogenous Inc. Uh, Exo. And so what we're gonna try to find out, so the URL for that is Exogenous Inc. One word.com. Um, the uh, result of this is uh, the fact that the world has already divided into three spheres, all of which are global in their extent, overlapping each other, but heading towards very different goals. Uh, and so what has happened in Africa in particular, of course, is that they've already um, decided in many respects. They have been caught between uh, Western um, foreign aid, which of course, uh, by and large, only made things worse. And what has happened over the course of, of the last uh, decade or so, which has been a, a massive uh, shift towards China. So um, these leapfrogging uh, activities uh, wind up uh, becoming um, in some sense, a contest between the three spheres. The three spheres are, in our view, East, West, and digital. They are based on different forms of literacy, which is the, the fundamental technology which shifts the human mind. Um, East is logographic. Um, the, uh, the glyphs actually mean something. They're also phonetic elements, but there's an underlying meaning associated with it. The West is alphabetic. There's no meaning uh, to A, B, C, D. Um, they were invented by the Phoenicians, uh, who um, uh, were the world's uh, uh, first uh, global traders, where the Mediterranean um, was the globe. And so they could come in with their alphabet and represent any phonetic language uh, in the alphabet. You didn't need meaning if all you're doing is, is writing commercial contracts. Um, the third is the digital sphere. And it is that sphere, I believe, which is the post-human, um, transhuman. Uh, its underlying linguistics is code or mathematics uh, based. Uh, and so the, the, the answer to your, yeah, it's correct, it's the matrix. And, and so the answer to your question is we are now in, a, in Africa and uh, South America and all the rest and leapfrogging are now caught in uh, what um, 
can only really be called uh, a three-body problem. Those of you who were familiar with the um, astrophysical dimension of three gravitational forces rotating around each other may have been reminded in the um, Chinese science fiction work by Shishin Liu. Um, the overall title for the trilogy is Remembrance of Earth's Past. The first book in that trilogy is entitled The Three-Body Problem. So that might be an interesting fictional way to enter into this whole thing. So uh, we, we have a, uh, a set of conflicts here, which could wind up being uh, uh, beyond all the rest we've talked about today, could wind up being really uh, severely uh, dire. And, and so I, I would just uh, uh, finish answering your question and perhaps what I have to say here today, uh, except for thanking you again, is that we have moved into a uh, not just a uh, a new transition in civilization, um, but we have moved into a situation in which we now have multiple rival civilizations, um, all trying uh, to displace the others. Uh, the danger associated with that um, is perhaps even greater and more immediate than the dangers of uh, AGI. Uh, perhaps even more uh, consequential uh, to our uh, practical lives as we go forward. Um, the conflicts that could arise from all of this are enormously important. And we have set ourselves at the center to try to drive uh, a deeper understanding of these phenomena in the hopes that at least some of the people uh, in positions of responsibility um, will take that responsibility seriously by pairing it with a deeper understanding of what is uh, driving um, uh, current events. Uh, again, thank you all very much. Um, uh, Peter and uh, Daljit had, had told me this would wind up being an hour and a half. Uh, I've, we've been fortunate, I've been fortunate that I only got one random phone call that wouldn't go away and uh, the doorbell hasn't rung. I've really enjoyed uh, spending an hour and a half with all of you and, uh, uh, and uh, I'm available. Uh, 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 you can you can get to me. Um, probably the easiest way to get to me is through LinkedIn. Um, uh, sending messages there. I don't need to give you a uh, email address, but I'm happy to correspond with and and uh, and pick up these uh, questions going forward. Again, thank you very much, Peter, for organizing this, and and Dalshit for for doing your homework as you have done um, expertly here and guided us uh, through this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. That was amazing. Such a dense uh, 90 minutes it was. Um, and just getting to that three spheres thesis at the end, maybe uh, teasing an, uh, a follow up. I mean, I would love to reserve the right to ask you back for another session here. I think there's so much to unpack. Um, yeah. Beginning, um, I, I would be um, really um, uh, mistaken if I didn't add this, and I'm not entirely sure how to get everybody's uh, properly aligned with this, but beginning on this Sunday, October 3rd, I'll be teaching an eight week course available for free to everybody. Uh, and I will get uh, Daljeet and Peter um, the links to this and, and, and so perhaps they can forward them to you. Um, but we've teamed up with a fellow by the name of Srikant Rajnakor who has done hundreds of uh, meet online meetups, including with some of us. And so Shukant will be organizing this. Will be two weeks, two uh, sessions on background, two on east, two on west, two on digital. So uh, eight weeks, uh, Sunday, 3 p.m. Eastern, uh, starting on this Sunday, October 3rd. Uh, you're all invited uh, to join uh, with us. I look forward to seeing you there and, um, and beyond. Fantastic. That sounds amazing. I'll certainly be signing up for that. All right. Well, thanks to everyone uh, for showing up. Hopefully you got something out of that. I greatly appreciate you, Mark, for all that you do and all you've shared. Uh, I think you've, you're a good piece that fits into the mix here at the Stowe, and I, I really appreciate and value your perspectives. And thank you, Peter, for allowing me uh, the space here uh, on the porch to, to share uh, this opportunity. So I appreciate you greatly. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.